This message is brought to you by Journey Life Church. Visit us today at journeylife.church or find us on Facebook. How many of you remember art class? Anybody remember art class in elementary school? Well, we had an awesome art teacher that allowed us to do whatever we wanted to do. Anything! You know, if it was paper mache, we were paper macheing over balloons or over uh, whatever it may be. Our faces, we, we probably did that once or twice. And uh, um, we, we were able to uh, color or draw or paint whatever we wanted to do. The art teacher was just like, yeah, go for it, man, go for it. And I'm not even quite sure that the art teacher was an art teacher. <laughs> I really don't know. I think that he might have been the janitor. Um, because his classroom was down in the basement. It was really, really weird. There was a lot of mops and brooms. And I think maybe they were just um, kind of low on teachers of that year. So um, I don't know. I, I think that he was more than just a, an art teacher. He was the janitor as well. But it was amazing. I had a great time in art class. I always have a good time in art class. Anybody else like art? Come on. Yeah. Art's fun, right? Yeah. It's expressive. It, it helps us to express ourselves and how we feel. Yeah, it's good. But one of my most favorite parts of art class was when we got to start mixing colors, right? Come on. We start mixing the colors. Red and blue make what? Purple. Purple, my favorite color. Don't tell anybody that's you. Um, <laughs> red, blue, purple. And how many of you remember the great commercial of the Ziploc baggies? Come on. And uh, yellow and blue make green. And I, every time I saw that, I'm like, oh, you guys are nuts. I already know that. I learned that in art class. Yellow and blue make green. And um, there's another uh, color, red and yellow, and yellow make orange. orange. And red, uh, green and red make, guess what? Brown. Brown. Good job. Oh, all right. You learned in art class. Um, but we all have the, all these different color schemes. And, and how many of you know that when you mix all the colors together, you get puke? Right? Oh, yeah. With all the colors that you mix together, it comes out looking disgusting and gross. But it's a great color to just slop around everywhere. But not only that, how about white and black? When you take white and black and you mix them together, you get what? Gray. gray. You get gray. It's no longer is it white or no longer is it black. As you mix them together, it is now gray. It's in the middle of the two spectrums. And today, we want to start a series talking about the gray areas in life. These gray areas in life are not necessarily black, and they're not necessarily white anymore. Um, sometimes you can even think of it this way, where black and white, you mix them together and it goes gray. And, and sometimes we do that in the church. Sometimes we do that in our own, in our own lives, where we take the black areas and we we kind of move it over. We, we take the black areas, we add a little white, hopefully that, that uh, the goodness of us and the, the badness of the black, we can move it over a little bit, adjust it, and we can have gray. Or it just might be that there's a gray area in Scripture that isn't very clear. It's not necessarily um, black or white. It's just one of those areas right in the middle where we could go one way or the other with it. So we're going to start a series on the gray areas of life, the gray areas in our own lives. Gray areas that we want to talk about in the next few weeks are not necessarily things that are black and white, that are black, that have gone to gray, but we want to talk about the gray areas of life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 and 24, it says this, and this is from the Corinthian church. And the Corinthian church just a little background here. Paul is addressing the Corinthian church because of all their faults and failures, all the things that they've been doing wrong in the church. They, they were starting to bring paganism into the church. They started bringing different things into it overall. And they were very hyper-spiritual, you know, speaking in tongues all the time. And Paul has to correct all these different things. But all these things came together, and they thought that they could do this with the freedom that they had in Christ. With freedom in Christ, therefore we can do all these things. And in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says this, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. 
So Paul, Paul is addressing all of these influences and things that were happening in the church in Corinth. And, and through freedom in Christ, they thought that they could go and do whatever they wanted, right? So they're saying, okay, I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to go do that, and I'm going to just get... So it was like a free-for-all. Whatever you wanted to do in the church, you could do. Paul says, absolutely, it's not always beneficial for you. If you say you can do everything, it's not beneficial. And sometimes it's not even constructive in your life. Our freedom is in Christ is not there so that we can indulge in anything that we want to do. Our freedom of Christ is freedom from what we used to do and a free life to do what we should do with God. Amen? So we have this idea of freedom in Christ, but it doesn't mean that we go out there and do whatever we want. We don't indulge. Freedom is from the sin that we have done in the past, and it's a freedom to walk in in what God has in store for us in the future. So black and white. There are several teachings in the Bible that are clearly that clearly articulate with little or no dispute, such as condemnation for fornication, lying, and stealing. There's things in the Bible that definitely are black. True? Yeah. There are many scriptures that will tell us time and time again, these things you shall not do. Don't do it. We even have the Ten Commandments to help guide us. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal. We have these things that are very black and white. The things that we know we should do. Scripture is very clear on certain things. But however, there are many issues in the Bible that don't have an absolute stand on. We call these the gray areas. I remember as a kid, there was a... Uh, there was black and white. There, uh, there, that's all there was. And um, I remember when I was growing up that, that the preachers always had a great message. And the message was always, what did you do this week? You're going to hell. <laughs> what? I did what? It was like that when I was growing up. I found myself at the altar every Wednesday, every Sunday night, every time I could. I was getting saved all over again. Because of the blackness that we used to teach, the, the things of, this is black, this is dark, don't even touch. Some of those things, such as smoking and drinking and playing cards, going to the movies. Did you know that I had to sign off in college that we would not go see a movie in a movie theater? Absolutely not. That's sinful. Black. Areas in our lives that we know that God says are black, but then there are some things that are a little bit gray. But I grew up in a, in a place where everything was black. There was, no, there was no room for error. There was no room for anything. And I remember the condemnation that came with it. It just felt like, oh my goodness, every Sunday, every Wednesday, I've got to go to the altar. I've got to go. I've got to go. I've got to go. I'm so, so, so much of a sinner. But those weren't always the times. There was always, there's something in there, though, that there should be some freedom in. Okay? But there are black areas that we have to watch. Amen? Very much throughout Scripture, we will see those black areas. But what does Scripture say about the black, black areas? It says that we should flee from them. In 2 Timothy 2, 2, it says, flee. Flee from these things. In Hebrews 2, 2, it says to strip them off or take them off. So in the black areas, we should take and discard the sin that so easily entangles us. We need to deal with that. On a regular basis, but there are, a, there is a thing called grace. Amen. God does share grace with us, but it does say that we are to run in the other direction. What is a gray area? A gray area is the, in the scriptures where it does not take a dogmatic stance on, or at the very least, issues that scripture does not discuss in depth. Let's see. Somebody give me some gray areas. Go ahead. Oh, come on. Gray areas. What are some things that you think in your mind that scripture is not, does not take that dogmatic stance, that it's not black and it's definitely not a white area, but it, it's kind of right in the middle. Gray areas. Come on. Wow, really? Goatees. Goatees. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. I'd say those are pretty black. But... Yeah, that's, that's anybody. What's a, what's a gray area? I'll give you one. Smoking. Okay, there's a gray area, 
right? Say something else. Come on. Just want to think with me. What? Drinking. Drinking, Drinking alcohol is a gray Driving area. Over the speed limit. Driving over the speed limit is a gray area. True. Yeah. Is it? Is it gray? Yeah. Okay. Actually, no. Yeah. Taking What's, drugs. Taking drugs could be um, if you're you're um, offered through prescription, um, maybe through prescription some certain certain drugs and. Maybe the overdose of that could be kind of, you know, you get into an area or if you're given a drug that is not yours to take, okay? Uh, what else? How about the movies? What? Movies. Movies. Rated R movies are sin, period, okay? There's no, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's a gray area. That's a very gray area. Yes. Dancing. Dancing. Dancing is a gray area. How many of you remember the day where you were not able to dance at all? Right? All right. See, we, we come from that, that place. Uh, what else? Playing cards is a gray area, right? Does scripture say one way or another in regards to playing cards? No. Anything else? Come on. Just throw them out there. We're just going to, we're going to be talking about Gambling. certain ones. Huh? Gambling. Gambling. There's another one. Is it, is it very strictly, clearly said in scripture that we should not gamble? Does it say there in scripture clearly? It's dogmatic and it says absolutely no gambling. Do we see that? So we do see in scripture that there are areas that it does not specifically talk completely about. True? Yes. So we have to deal with those gray areas in our own lives. How do I deal with the gray area in my life? How do you deal with the gray area in your life? Now I want to offer something. When a gray area ever becomes excessive, I think that it becomes more, it, it kind of pulls it over. If we're in excess, if we're doing things that are above and beyond, what, maybe that's not exactly what I should say right now. So we'll talk about this more as we go along in the series. But gray areas that do not just come out and say in Scripture, it does not come out and say that. Every one of the topics that we mentioned above, or, or what we just said, um, are not discussed in Scripture to the place where it's a black and white. Scripture does not teach that any of these things are categorically sinful, that they are bad in themselves. Now, two things that we need to recognize is this. Spiritual preference versus spiritual principle. Spiritual preference would be gray areas, and spiritual principle are the black and white. Debates regarding gray area issues have caused major rifts between individuals, communities, and churches. True? Gray areas have caused a great divide in our churches and in our own lives. A spiritual principle is teaching specifically found in Scripture. So we know that spiritual Principle are teachings that are found specifically in Scripture. For example, in Thessalonians 4, 3, and 5, it says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should not le or should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passion lust like the heathen who do not know God. There is very strict Scripture, specific Scriptures on that. True? Pornography. Lust. These things are very, very clear in Scripture. A spiritual <laughs> preference is a believer's decision to do or not to do something that is based on personal biblical convictions. <clears throat> Let's stop just for a minute. Spiritual preference. When I read Scripture, how do I interpret that for myself? When I read scripture, there are some things in our lives where how am I going to interpret? What is God speaking to me in regards to this gray area in my life? How do I need to respond? How should I respond? And sometimes it's a matter of conscience. It's how do I think in my own conscience? Is, is this going to make me feel over here or am I okay on this side? How about this? How many of you believe that you shouldn't kiss before marriage. There are many people out there today that would say that you shouldn't kiss before marriage. And you know what kissing does, right? It leads right to, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Oh, um, but kissing, let's just say that. Let's just say that, that there's a, a kissing argument. Now, just because I believe that it's, 
that that's what I want to do, is that I want to kiss until I'm married and go on from there. You know, that's my preference. Now, if somebody else says that, it, it's not clear in Scripture. So one way or another, we have to take on our conscience. What does it say about us? It does not display. Uh, so what is, what is wrong with our spiritual preference, our spiritual principles? What is wrong with that? What is wrong is that sometimes we can have that divide that we were talking about. And one thing that I have seen over time in the church just recently is a great divide in the church on what we believe is right and what's wrong. And then when it comes to great issues, we separate the church right down the middle. Now, my problem that I have with that is that when we divide the church, if we have things that are dividing the church, we become separate. A house that is divided against itself, what? It's going to fall apart. And if the world sees us arguing things, let's say on social media, how many of you have seen the arguments go back and forth on social media? Anybody? Facebook. All the time you have one person saying one thing, and then it's another Christian saying something totally different. And uh, the last thing that really kind of got me was the one thing with Kim Davis. Now, I don't know how you stand on Kim Davis, what if she's, if she's, a, if she's a, a hero to some or she's not. But I saw two men, two pastors in our Assemblies of God denomination, basically battling it out on this. And it separated one section and another section. And you could see the great divide over a gray issue. It really had nothing to do with anything. It was just a very gray issue. Was she supposed to have just step down or should she stand up for her belief system? But it separates the church. That's my thing. When it comes to gray areas that start to separate and divide, maybe we need to get back together on situations and talk about them, come to a, conclu a conclusion on those things. So that's what can happen if we take our spiritual preferences and uh, we make them into spiritual principles. And we've done that before, haven't we? Let's just take smoking for a, for a second. Smoking in itself is, isn't, isn't sin, is it? It doesn't say in scripture that smoking is sin. No. But what we've done in the church, as we've said, that smoking is sin. And then what we've done is created a big divide. Now that we've pulled it into a principle, which isn't clearly stated in Scripture, we've made a divide in the church. So we, we take our, our, our spiritual ideas of what we think and we divide the church. But we need to be very careful when it comes to spiritual preference and spiritual principle. Spiritual principle is, comes from the scriptures itself. Amen? When we have spiritual pr uh, principles, those are things that God states clearly. Those are things that we do not divert one way or another. We stay on the road with those. But spiritual preferences are things that we need to be very careful and communicate with and talk about within the church without it dividing us. Amen? So how do I, or here's, what's, what are some questions that I can ask myself in order to find out my spiritual preference? Um, here it is. Is it sin? Number one, is it biblically stated in Scripture? Does it say it is sin? That's one first thing you need to do is ask yourself. If you think it's a gray area, ask yourself, is it sin? Is it something that God has stated absolutely do not do? Does it negatively affect a fellow believer? Does it negatively affect a fellow believer? If you have, let's just say, let's say you have an alcoholic, okay, has come become a Christian. And in your, in your um, spiritual preference, you say that it's okay to drink. Now, if you have somebody in your presence that you know has had a problem or an issue with alcohol, should you drink alongside a person like that? I think that what we should do is look to the other and see if that's something that would negatively affect them. If it's going to negatively affect them, then I need to think of them before myself. True? If it's going to negatively affect them, I need to think about them before myself. Even that passage of scripture, our very first passage of scripture, it says this. It says, no one should seek their own good, but the good of others. We're always supposed to be looking out for other people. So just because you think it may be right, how does it affect someone else negatively? Question number three. Does it affect your testimony to unbelievers? How does it affect your testimony? How does that affect your testimony? I'll, I'll leave that one. Think about that for me. How does that affect your testimony to unbelievers? 
Does it help your testimony or does it affect it negatively? Depends on where you are. Depends on where you are. Okay. How does it affect? How does it affect your testimony? Can there be a positive in something? If you can walk in and sit down as a brother with somebody, mm -hmm. have a beer, smoke a cigarette, whatever, and talk about God with them, then your testimony is going to be good. You go to your cousin's house and he's been through a lot, but they were raised strict, and maybe that would be a negative to them. Exactly. You have to see your audience. Who is it that, that you're around? You really have to take into consideration, is that going to affect my testimony one way or another? Because honestly, like you said, if I, if I go in and sit with my cousin that's very strict and I have a, a beer or something like that, how have I affected my testimony then with them? We're always to be thinking about other people when it comes to our, 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 um, our, our spiritual preferences and those things that we have, okay? Number four, does it go against your conscience? Does it go against your conscience? Is it something that you know is wrong? In your own life, that for you is something that's wrong. If it's a gray area, how does it go against your conscience? If it goes against your conscience, then it's probably something that you probably shouldn't do. Paul links a good conscience with sincere faith. When people depart from faith, their conscience can also become seared. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When your conscience becomes seared? When we walk away a little bit and... Um, Maybe it's a, a, a situation where we, we become desensitized in, in our lives. Anybody ever been desensitized to something in your life? When you, at one time you believed that it was wrong, and your conscience was that this is wrong, this is wrong for me, I'm not going to do this. And sometime, somehow over time that becomes seared, and you become desensitized by the world. Well, if the world can do it, I, I, you know, it's not that bad, is it? Or you start to compromise in your, your route of your conscience. But always, always... Does it go against your conscience? Does it go against what you, you believe? Lastly, is it unwise? Biblical wisdom is both religious and, religious and practical, stemming from the fear of the Lord. It branches out to, the, to touch all of life. Wisdom. We are told in Scripture that if we lack wisdom, that we should ask for wisdom. True? If we lack the wisdom in a circum circumstance or a situation or a gray area in our life, we should ask God for the wisdom that he would give us. And whatever God's speaking to your heart through your conscience, however that is, that's where you need to, to be in the gray areas. Not only should we do that and ask God, but we have other people. We have wisdom from other believers that can help us with those situations. Are your decisions answering the uh, are your decisions answering the five questions in ways that are pleasing to God? Th th that's my last real question. Is what I am doing when I talk about my gray areas, are they pleasing to God? I know that this is kind of a hard hard thing to get in the minds uh, and hearts because we do come from two sides of the coin, do we not? A lot of the things that we have said that are gray, for some of us, are very black and white. True? There are a lot of us that stand against a lot of the gray areas. I'll just say one. Alcohol. Alcohol is a divider in the church. True? Yes. It can be. Alcohol is a very divisive one because there are a lot of older people, people that have been in church like me, who would say that alcohol is absolutely wrong? It is a sin to drink alcohol. But in Scripture, it does not say strictly that, that drinking alcohol is a sin, does it? It doesn't. Then we have the other side that we have people of, you know, we have the freedom of Christ. I can have an alcoholic beverage. We have the two sides. And what happens is when we pull our side this way and you pull your side that way, and when we do this, what happens is we begin to divide the church. And what we want to do through the series is to show that we can come to a happy medium between the two. We know that alcohol in excess is what? It's sin. It's wrong. That in itself, the excess of alcohol is definitely a sin. It's drunkenness, right? right. If we come to a place of drunkenness in our lives, we know that that is sin. Clearly stated in Scripture. But in itself, alcohol is not a sin. But it's hard gray area to come to terms on, isn't it? When you've been
been raised like I have, I'll be honest. When you've been raised in a church like I have, it's very hard to give up certain things. Here's one illustration. You can come if you want. Here's one illustration. I worked with a lady at uh, Assembly God headquarters. And um, I was brought up that, that smoking is a sin. Smoking sin. I was brought up that way. Man, you, you don't touch the cigarettes. You don't touch the alcohol. You don't touch any of these things. If you do, you're bound for hell. I, that's how I, I'm serious. That's how I was brought to believe. There was no grace. There was no love. It was just all real condemnation. You better get your life straight because if you do sin, you're going straight to hell. You always got to come back to that place of, 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 of reconciliation with God. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm failing. I'm failing. I'm failing. I said a cuss word at school today. Oh, I better get to the altar. Ah. I lived in such a way that it was not um, eternal security. It was e internal insecurity. Anyway, going back to this relationship with uh, this lady. She said she was a Christian woman, and uh, she smoked cigarettes. I'm like, absolutely not. You're not a Christian. You're not. Do you smoke cigarettes? I can tell you right now that it's a sin, and you're going to hell. You're not a Christian. That's what I did. And do you know that after getting to know her, I found out that this woman had a great heart after God. Oh, my goodness. A woman that smoked cigarettes had an impact on my life. And what we do in times of gray areas is we divide it so much. And there's a place where we got to give some breaks. There's got to be a little bit of leniency. We have to understand, though, on the other side of it, if we do partake in these things, where can it lead us to? Where does it go? So in the middle of these gray areas, we've got to share grace with each other. And we've got to also remember that we've got to think of somebody else other than ourselves in this moment. I had to think of this woman in a different way. I had to think that she had an issue. She smoked, but it didn't affect her heart. Honestly, that gray area didn't affect her heart. The way that I talked to her, the way that she would communicate with me, I knew that this woman had a life that was grounded in faith. And I guess why I want to talk about gray areas too is, is so that we don't get to the place where we neglect the black areas. That we don't neglect sin because sin is sin. Right? And sin can lead us to a life that we don't want to be in. And I don't want us to get to be a part of the church where, where the Corinthians were and they were pulling paganism into their church and saying that it's okay to do these things. I don't want us to get to be a place where the church starts to say, okay, well, let's just take a little bit of fornication. You know, I, I'm okay. Let's just pull a little bit of that over here. Sexuality. Well, let's just pull a little bit of sexuality over here into the gray area. When it, we know strictly that sexuality is a black and white type of thing. And we want to pull these things into a gray area. I don't want us to be there either. I don't want ever to see the church come and start accepting the things that are wrong for the things that are right. And it says in the last days what? Wrong will become right. And right will become wrong. And you can see that all across this world. You can see it in your life. You can see it in, in people's lives around you. That's where it's gone. But now we've accepted the black areas smeared the line and made them gray. My question to you today is that in these gray areas, are they honoring to God? Are these gray areas in your life a deterrent or a distraction from other people? 